So what is Gekige no Kitaro? Today's video is a spoiler-free overview of my experiences with the franchise consisting of these entries. In this beginner's guide, I aim to simplify everything, making it approachable for beginners. Kitaro is a variety show focusing on Japanese spirits, monsters, and folktales. These mostly self-contained episodes are divided into comedic, mysterious, spooky, moral, and action-oriented experiences. Although fights are frequent, I rarely felt it was the point of the episode, and many battles are won quickly as clever writing is paramount. Our heroes ward off swarms of eyes by burning incense and chopping onions, reflecting their magic with a mirror, or tricking a yokai into defeating himself, just as an example. Surprisingly, many episodes have no fights, providing a similar experience to the Twilight Zone. Here, deceptive yokai disguise damnation as a gift while the depraved inadvertently condemn themselves to suffer. What sets Kitaro apart from your ordinary monster-fighting protagonist is his neutrality. He only saves humans when he feels they're in the right or deserve a second chance. Otherwise, he stands by or punishes them himself. Its general morality favors a relaxing, harmonious life where misfortune follows tenacity, apathy, and corruption. It's also exemplified by Kitaro spending his days relaxing in a secluded treehouse contrasted against the mischievous Otoko. He's a cross between Lupin's Fujiko, Charlie Brown's Pigpen, and Trailer Park Boy's Ricky. He's always scheming for money by immoral means and will often betray Kitaro. He's my favorite character because his episodes are usually layered as he manipulates everyone and quickly improvises when his plans fail, which they typically do. He may not be admirable, but he is comical and interesting. The history of Gekige no Kitaro goes back as far as Japanese animation. In the 1930s, Kamishibai performer Masami Ito illustrated a story starring Kitaro, a disfigured boy born in a graveyard to the ghost of motherhood. Although little is known, it left a lasting impression on childhood yokai enthusiast, veteran, and manga artist Shigeru Mizuki. To my surprise, its original manga, Hakaba Kitaro, was darker and more graphic, as seen on page 3, when someone opens a box from his new neighbor containing an eyeball. The story begins as a disgusted recipient of an unmarked eyeball heads to work at a blood bank uncovering another mystery. Somehow, yokai blood was donated, contaminating their supply. Upon further investigation, he finds the mysterious donor only to be warned that he's already dead. Slowly, he opens the door, and as you turn the page, BAM! This decrepit zombie staring you in the face, and then he offers you tea. In the manga, Kitaro's origin is similar to the 30s Kamishi by play as he's born from a dying ghost in a graveyard. After being rejected by his adoptive father, the blood bank agent, Kitaro is left to wander the world in ignorance. Thankfully, his birth father is still around for support, though he's capable of little else since he's an adorable anthropomorphic eyeball who likes dad jokes and bathing in tea. Its story came to life after Otoko's introduction as his schemes became the catalyst for plot progression. Although he's not a villain, he's the type of guy who'd plant a demonic seed in you, pretend to be your friend, and silently watch as it consumes your soul, transforming your body into a tree, all so he can make a few bucks. Before moving on, I want to briefly jump to 2008, since the 11 episode series by the same name is the only anime to cover Kitaro's origin. I loved its presentation as it faithfully captured Mizuki's art style, plus the grim and foreboding atmosphere. Sadly, I felt its story wasn't as faithful. Sure, the basic plot is the same, but it occludes the context behind some of my favorite jokes and alters their delivery. It probably sounds like a minor complaint, but the build-up for my favorite joke was several chapters in the making. Although it's still funny, and a viable starting point for newcomers, I enjoy the manga more. Before becoming an anime, it underwent another transformation. Mizuki remade the series in the form of Gekeke no Kitaro, slightly toning down its dark aesthetic, increasing its humor, and opting for an episodic plotline. Now its stories are self-contained, primarily within one chapter, but a few spanning several. After getting the much-needed context from Hakaba, I read Gekeke casually while watching the anime. 
Although I enjoyed several chapters, I mostly read it for its art. After all, many of these stories have evolved dramatically due to being adapted countless times. Unfortunately for manga readers, its localization is an absolute mess. I wasn't able to read the entire series, but I read assorted chapters through two different releases. First is the seven volume, the Kotaro collection, and the second was from Drawn and Quarterly, the only version mostly still in print. It's additionally confusing because both localized releases contain the Birth of Kitaro chapter, but they differ dramatically. The DQ release features better artwork with worse panel placement and missing pages. Also, the aforementioned eyeball in a box scene is missing. I know it should be there because it's in a different version, plus it's included in the 2008 Hakaba Kitaro anime released eight years before the DQ volume. Additionally, the page turned zombie surprise was ruined due to their adjacent panel placement. It's possible they're earnestly printing all the content given to them, but there's just too much missing, like the entirety of Kitaro's Night Tale, spanning 22 chapters across nearly 600 pages. Although I felt the Hakaba Kitaro anime series wasn't 100% faithful, it's still the best version of Kitaro's origin you can find outside of the elusive Kitaro collection manga. Additionally, the remaining DQ chapters appear arbitrarily chosen. I know it's episodic, so continuity is irrelevant, but their chapters appear erratically chosen after the first volume. Take a look at these release dates. I understand if they're only licensing a few chapters at a time, but why can't they at least order them sequentially within each volume? On the positive side, I found the DQ releases mostly faithful, though I didn't compare them page by page outside of Kitaro's birth. Unfortunately, the volume containing the highest concentration of my favorite chapters was their first, titled Shigeru Mizuki's Kitaro, which currently appears out of print because it's not available on Right Stuff and only secondhand on Amazon. Needless to say, I recommend watching the anime over reading the manga. However, if you are an avid manga reader, I'm covering Mizuki's other works in a future video. Now, back to the anime. If you're wondering about the differences between these entries, they're basically remakes, and yes, it's ridiculous considering only one has a proper introduction. In this next segment, I'll give my general thoughts on each installment while highlighting my favorite episodes as examples. Although I love the manga's art, I thought the 1968 anime hit the perfect balance for what a kid's show should be, at least from a western perspective. For that reason, I immediately began enjoying myself despite its lack of an introduction. It's hard to explain, but it just feels right, and some episodes are still worth watching. I'll give my examples later when I contrast them against their contemporaries. Surprisingly, I think some 60s episodes are still the best, though it's a shame that it's only partially translated. Unfortunately, the 1971 entry only had three translated episodes, but they're all pretty good. My favorite was episode 3, following Otoko's scheme to swindle money from a film studio while plotting the yokai against each other for profit. As expected, problems arise spiraling everything out of control. The episode feels so eventful and dense, it could have been a movie. I also liked episode 17, though it's untranslated. It seems like Otoko plots to spark the next world war by using a mind control yokai bug to start a brawl between world leaders. I watched 20 1971 episodes and enjoyed my experience, though I couldn't understand most of it. Although I can't speak on its connection to the manga, it was a faithful experience to the 60s anime, mixing horror, humor, and morals into numerous tiny packages. The 1985 entry has 77 translated episodes, including the 1988 Jigoku Hen, serving as its conclusion. It takes the feel of previous Kitaro content, but elevates it to the standards of the 1980s, improving character designs, animations, and plot complexity. A good example is episode 8, when Otoko rents an apartment to use as a consulting office for struggling yokai at a profit. The only problem is that yokai don't need human money, and the poor yokai certainly don't have any. I love this episode for two reasons. First, it's eventful as Otoko improvises and fails several times. Like when his consulting gig fails, he gets his friends to scare everyone out so he can become landlord. 
Secondly, it detailed the lore behind a scum-eating yokai struggling because modern bathrooms are so easy to clean that he's out of a job. Although Kitaro's father often gives brief yokai exposition, this method was my favorite since it doesn't feel like info dumping. On the other hand, Episode 3 was a great example of the stylistic diversity of having numerous directors cover the same content. In the Gekigen manga, there's a village overrun with cats. Kitaro investigates and gets into a fight with him. It's pretty straightforward. The 1985 adaptation provides a similar experience but offers a better introduction as Otoko accidentally finds a treasure inside a shrine and steals it. This angers the cat yokai, causing them to rampage the town. Again, Kitaro intervenes, but combat is expanded by including his yokai friends. While it may be faithful, I enjoyed 1968 episode 17 more. Here it explains the lore behind the shrine, the reluctance of construction workers to demolish it, and the villagers' perspective after the angry felines take control, which was my favorite part. The cats force the humans to become their servants, cooking them meals they eat from the tables while the humans worship them and eat from the floor like pets. Even the police officer was too afraid to intervene. It retains the best qualities of the manga version by making them scary and including a fight towards the end, but adds intrigue by making its plot more complex. Sure, its fight animation wasn't as good as the 80s, but I typically prefer substance over action in this type of anime. While this may have begun in the 70s, the 80s delved deeper into human yokai relations and their emotional struggles, something we'd see increasingly in subsequent entries. A good example was episode 43, when a struggling musician became famous after plagiarizing a water imp song. Of course, when you're famous, news travels fast, so naturally, the water imps heard of this thievery and weren't happy. Although its premise feels like a static horror episode, things gradually develop, revealing the perspectives of both the musician and the water imp, making for a touching yet comical experience. This type of episode is one of Gekike no Kitaro's unique strengths. You enjoy all of the suspense and mystery as the spooky anticipation rises. You expect something terrible to happen, then it's subverted as hidden motivations are revealed, changing your experiences from something more heavy and dark to something more lighthearted, emotional, and comedic. The seven-episode Jigoku Hen acts as the anime's conclusion by introducing an arc where Kitaro looks for his mother, who's dramatically altered from canon. Although it's the first Kitaro series with a translated conclusion, I doubt anyone will watch it since its picture quality is so bad. Sure, the clips I use look fine, but that's not the version I watched. If you're not fluent in Japanese, you're stuck with 77 episodes of a subtitled VHS recording from a TV including the Japanese commercials and VHS artifacts. While it's mostly bearable, I doubt most will put up with it. Thankfully, the 80s movies were in much better condition, even receiving HD remasters. The first is Ghost War Struggle from 1986. It's a remake of my least favorite part from the manga and 68 anime, the Monster War arc. I didn't care for it then because it's two episodes heavily prioritizing action pitting yokai against western monsters like vampires, werewolves, and witches. Ghost War Struggle is the same, but with a visual overhaul. It could be fun for kids, but I think it's some of the weakest content. Next, The Strongest Ghost Army retells the events featured in 1971 Episode 2, where a yokai turns Kitaro and friends into fabric and humans into zombies when worn. He uses this tactic to gain a foothold in the human world and take over. I didn't care for this episode the first time I saw it, and this didn't offer any improvements other than its visuals, so there's little reason to watch, especially because it's never been translated. Similarly, the final in the 1986 movie trilogy, The Great Rebellion, is also an untranslated generic monster battle, so it's safe to overlook. To clarify my disposition towards the fights, it's only the long fights occupying more than half of any movie or episode. After all, people wouldn't like a Pokemon movie solely revolving around a single battle because it's the story that makes it worth watching. The same is true for Kitaro, so I think its best content depicts fights between 0 and 25% of the episode. When a fight is 5 minutes long, it's comical for him to drink a water yokai and freeze himself before spinning its frozen body out into a special jar, but if that same fight were 15 or 20 minutes, you'd be underwhelmed. 
Furthermore, longer fights detract from storytelling, its greatest strength. Kitaro's appeal mainly lies in its build-up. A good example is the Suiko chapter. 1968 episode 14 diverges from the manga by immediately sending the water yokai out on a rampage, destroying everything. The only story is that it's loyal to the orphan girl who unknowingly freed him. His anger is exacerbated by the villagers blaming her for the destruction. Because so little time is devoted to build up, the episode felt bland. Contrasting it to the manga and the faithful 1985 episode 9 adaptation, you'll see balance makes them better experiences. Instead of going on a rampage, Suiko inhabits the body of a boy, causing him to act strangely, requiring his parents to summon Kitaro for an exorcism. Kitaro looks at the clues and determines its motives, which are actually relatable. The yokai doesn't want to cause any problems and only reacts after being driven out of the boy's body. Although it's only 15 pages, it accomplishes more than the 1968 adaptation by creating mystery, personifying the yokai with its motives, and a short but sweet fight. 1985 episode 9 is similar but expands on the premise by adding the humor of Otoko trying to scam the parents before Kitaro arrives. I understand Kitaro is a kid's anime, and kids like the action, but it's best when fights are used sparingly as plot devices, similar to my previous example. If that's not enough to convince you, I'll just say this. Yokai, including Kitaro, are canonically immortal from the very beginning, so Finding clever ways to seal them away or reason with them is the only answer. Moving on, I unfortunately have little to say about the 1996 series as less than 10% is translated and I can't find anything raw. Still, I enjoyed its comedically clever writing, like in episode 2, when they ward off a flock of demonic eyeballs by burning incense and cutting onions. Naturally, Otoko's apathetic get-rich-quick schemes return, like in episode 5 when he lures humans to be eaten by a monster so he can collect its diamond excrement. Although several of these episodes are remakes, I think some were an overall improvement, like in episode 3, when the hair monster featured in 1968 episode 2 returns to play music and steal souls. I don't think either had a great story, still, something like this should be creepy and the 90s version excels in that area despite being hindered by an oversaturated rip with a slightly distorted aspect ratio. While I enjoy these episodes, number 10 was my favorite. It begins with an ordinary haunted house theme, dark forest, and creepy cobweb latent interiors. Still, its plot elevates it to another level, becoming dramatic and heartwarming in ways I don't want to spoil. It's a shame I can't see more, but at least the next three 90s movies are subbed. The Giant Sea Monster retells the manga faithful 1968 episodes 5 and 6. The 1996 movie follows Kitaro investigating the disappearance of a botanist on a mysterious island. Here, he's kidnapped by a flying gonorrhea monster and engages in one of the better animated fights in the franchise while a mass of hairy monsters stumbles through the city, dealing with its military. While the plot is slightly more complex than I'm giving it credit for, I don't want to spoil either version. I prefer the 1968 episodes for its mystery, betrayal, and comical yet engaging battle between a massive kaiju and mech, only this time it's a parody seemingly subverting the trope by making you root for the monster instead of the machine. There's just more substance in the 60s version, so I recommend watching those episodes first. Surprisingly, the 30 minute 1997 movie Obake Nider reimagines and improves upon 1968 episode 1. They're both about a boy who finds a yokai instant home run baseball bat and abuses it, prompting Kitaro to challenge his team to a game for their soul. The 60s version left a positive first impression because it depicts the irony of someone's life potentially being ruined by their desires. I enjoyed the game because although the boy had a sure chance of hitting home runs, the yokai had many tricks of their own. Both versions have a similar plot and runtime, but what gives the 1997 movie the edge is its build-up, providing much more characterization for the boy and his team. It feels more efficiently written, and its visuals send it over the top by capturing the same horrific vibe presented in the manga, but with the beauty of HD remastered cell animation. Sadly, the 1997 Yokai Express is another attempt at the Yokai War arc, but it's worse due to being confined within a 
a flying train. Maybe James Bond or Jackie Chan could pull off a good train fight, but not monsters with magical powers. While there's little substance, there were a few beautifully animated nighttime flybys over the cityscape. The 2007 series witnessed the largest stylistic transformation in the franchise. Previous background characters return with a recurring role, transforming Kitaro's forest into a community of friendly yokai. This alters its dynamic by making cute and comical interactions as common as the spooks, mysteries, morals, or fights. It also changes the nature of combat, as Kitaro now has electrical aura attacks, a spirit gun, and expanded capabilities of his pre-existing items. I was initially against these changes as I felt Kitaro was losing its soul and becoming a generic shonen action series. Thankfully, I was wrong, and this entry has many good qualities it brings to the franchise. I still think flashy fights don't fit, but I can understand the necessity for them to try new things after so many years. One example of 2007's unique contribution is episode 15, where Kitaro's father feels inadequate due to his stature and reliance on his son. He secretly works part-time jobs to buy him a bike, creating a heartwarming and comical experience. We rarely see any introspection or personal development, and he pushes his soft, tiny body to do something special for the one he loves. It's a great example of why you should keep an open mind, because some of my favorite episodes in the franchise came from a series I thought I disliked the most. I also enjoyed its Deal with the Devil episodes. For example, episode 11 follows two failing comedians who offer their souls to a fox yokai in exchange for popularity. In the beginning, they make puns and tell dad jokes with only one fan. You can guess who that is. After the deal, they still make puns and tell dad jokes, but everyone likes them. Now they're torn over the satisfaction of a hollow victory. I like the episode because it conveys the moral of earning your victories and understanding your strengths, but it's lighthearted as the two are generally good people and isn't as dark as something like episode 34. 34 covers content from 1968 episode 13. Here, two bank robbers flee into the Gekeke forest to escape police. Kitaro realizes evil humans are near, but chooses to do nothing. He doesn't have to because their karmic debt is due and they'll find their way to hell on their own. These are some of my favorite episodes because people ironically hang themselves from a rope spun of their own depravity while the monsters don't do anything. I think both versions are equally good, which is most surprising for 60s anime because its themes were unexpected for me at the time. The 2008 movie Nippon Bakuretsu is another polarizing entry. I didn't like it, but I can understand why some might. It features a variety of yokai interconnected in an evolving plot, exciting fights, and beautiful animation, except for the ugly CG monster. Additionally, I found its plot long-winded. Sure, a lot happens, but not enough for an 80-minute runtime. The 97 episode 2018 series captures everything there is to love about the franchise as a grand celebration for its 50th anniversary. If you like the moral and dramatic episodes, it's darker and more emotional. Its horror elements are highlighted by its fantastic production value. Its heartwarming and comedic elements return with its lovable cast. And lastly, its action expands to arcs and benefits from its visual overhaul. Of course, that last one is a con for me, but there's enough room for everything in an anime of this length. This time, its plot is divided into episodic and linear segments introducing recurring villains. Although they were one-dimensional, you rarely see them outside of their respective arcs. Plus, I enjoyed some of their episodes, like the time they assembled the body parts for a giant yokai. You can spot the differences in 2018 with its first episode, the Vampire Tree Chapter. Compared to its predecessors, 68 and 07 were both straightforward, though I preferred the 60s version for its creepy transformations and mystery elements as the trees are treated as a plague sweeping a neighboring village. Comparatively, 2007 evenly split the episode between comical antics and a brawl with an evil yokai who just comes out of nowhere. On the other hand, 2018 introduces a massive tree feeding off of negative emotions stemming from social media usage. 
Admittedly, the entire 2018 series has an axe to grind against kids these days and their smartphones. I think the connection between depression and social media usage is significant and a goldmine for anime content, but this focused on the conflict too early to do anything more than make a vague observation. Regardless, it's still the best Vampire Tree episode in my opinion, though my favorite is still the Hakabaki Taro manga. Another good example is Episode 7, depicted in 1968 Episode 7 and 2007 Episode 9. The premise is that a couple of jerks draw out Kitaro's vengeful side and he teaches them a lesson by tricking them into boarding a haunted train. The 2007 entry was the weakest considering it's as plain as I've just described. However, the 1968 version was one of my favorite episodes. Here, Otoko and Kitaro decide to end the human monopoly on haunted houses by opening their own. Theoretically, real monsters should be scarier, but things don't go as planned, causing Kitaro to intervene. It's just a witty yet simple premise. However, 2018 elevated it to a new level by adding mysterious, psychological, and spooky elements. Here, you don't know what the character did to be punished, and it's slowly revealed as you put the clues together. It's one of the better examples of how different directors make a world of difference. I loved episode 54, similar to 1971 episode 2, covering environmental themes of over-industrialization, but I prefer the newer version. Both are about a mud monster, upset over his destroyed rice fields and dealing with environmental issues. However, 2018 is much more complex due to how close it hits home for Kitaro. On one hand, the mud monster is the victim, but on the other hand, Kitaro feels responsible for the hardships he caused the human perpetrator 30 years ago. It's one of the rare occasions that alludes to the implied history behind Kitaro's immortality. As you can imagine, I was exhausted after watching so much Kitaro in a month, but 2018 reinvigorated my love for the franchise. It features so many dramatic and moral episodes revolving around humans tormented by their deals with yokai, but it also contains emotional episodes surrounding yokai, like in episode 41, where this old man moves and the spirits of the items he left behind become depressed and look for him. Those who shun Kitaro for its childish aesthetic or lengthy episodic content will miss out on some great experiences, like having a one-eyed straw sandal bring a tear to their eye. Since I mentioned the Suiko chapter earlier, 2018 episode 64 surprisingly builds upon the foundation of 1968 episode 14, keeping a similar premise but improving its narrative balance. It's one of the darker episodes following a woman struggling after moving due to her husband's career. Unfortunately, everyone there is rude and her husband is at the mercy of a ruthless boss. Like the 60s version, she accidentally frees Suiko and is helpless to stop him from eliminating her sorrows the best way it knows how. It's one of those be careful what you wish for moments, revealing the deepest, darkest parts of the human subconscious. I don't think it's inherently better than the aforementioned chapter or 1985 episode 9, but it is a monument to the franchise's stylistic diversity which I hope encourages you to watch more than one installment. One aspect I couldn't get used to was its modern setting, as several episodes revolve around technology. I didn't think any were bad, but it's jarring considering I began with the 60s anime and the 50s manga. For example, several episodes revolve around their version of YouTube. These episodes involve yokai becoming YouTubers or humans manipulating yokai for views at the city's expense. While they nail the toxic influencer mentality, I wish it weren't so one-sided as the franchise generally favors tradition and shuns technology. That being said, there were a few technology-oriented, serious episodes, such as 25, with the app that makes people kill themselves, which feels similar to the anime Hell Girl. One major positive for 2018 is that it's entirely translated so you can watch its ending. Although I'm not a fan of the battle arcs, I can't say it's unique to this entry as I couldn't watch every episode of the earlier versions. If that's what you're into, they certainly go all out towards the end. However, I'm fine with its episodic content and I don't need an ending. Now onto what you're all waiting for, the recommended watch order. There's no right or wrong way to experience Kitaro, so you're free to watch whatever you want. However, there are two ways I think are best. First, 
combine 2008's Hagaba Kitaro with 2018's Gekeke no Kitaro. They're the only fully translated series in the franchise and they go well together. Plus, they've got the most linear content if you want to go from beginning to end. Secondly, the way I recommend most is my curated sampler pack. Here I've listed all of my favorites from the franchise and you can take a screenshot and watch in the order you prefer. When you finish, if you feel like you've had enough, that's fine. Stop. If you want more, that's great because there's a lot more. I initially wanted to include a ranking segment, but I can't. Instead, I view these anime as equals. Despite covering similar content, they all have unique strengths and weaknesses thanks to their episode director's creative freedom. There wasn't a single series without episodes I disliked, but there's also not a single series that isn't worth preserving and translating. They all have niche audiences who will like them for different reasons, and hopefully I've prepared you with enough information to have a good time with the franchise. If you love yokai and can't get enough, I've got a few more recommendations. First, 2005's The Great Yokai War. Strangely, I'm recommending you something featuring a yokai war that's also a live action movie. It's not directly related to Gekeke no Kitaro, but it's likely a tribute. Some scenes were shot on Mizuki Road, showing a Neko Musume mascot and a Kitaro statue. Many of its yokai are horrific versions of the cuties you've seen in the anime, but the icing on the cake is Shigeru Mizuki's brief cameo towards the end. It's nothing spectacular, as he was quite old at the time. I think if I had this movie as a kid, it would have scared the crap out of me, and I'd love it. They did a great job with costume design and the practical effects of many yokai while others were CG that looked great for 2005. I also loved watching the yokai's comical banter. Everything about the movie was well made, but my only complaint is its runtime. It's basically a two hour long kids empowerment fantasy and while there's nothing wrong with that, I struggled to hold my attention around the halfway point. To its credit, the second half was a massive war, but its narrative wasn't strong enough to hold my attention as an adult, so if you've got kids, it's something you both might enjoy. There's also two Gekeke no Kitaro live action movies, and they're exactly as corny as you'd expect. Although I usually write these off as high-budget costume roleplay videos, I enjoyed the first movie. It was aware of how corny it was and played to its strengths. Look at Neko Musume's haircut and tell me they're taking it too seriously. There's also an engaging story of a father struggling to provide for his family, giving in to temptation and stealing a treasure belonging to a fox yokai who haunts his family. It's 100 minutes long, but I never got bored thanks to its smooth pacing. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the 2008 movie Kitaro and the Millennium Curse. In fact, I can't say anything because I didn't finish it and I can't remember why. It could be a decent movie, but maybe I'm just burnt out on yokai. I also played the Gekeke no Kitaro Game Boy Advance game and had a good time. It's what some would call a Metroidvania with a leveling system, items, a branching map, and special abilities. Surprisingly, its story follows Hakaba Kitaro and from what I can tell tries to stay faithful to various manga chapters as you go flying around Japan fighting yokai. Although it's currently untranslated, I got a basic understanding of item functionality thanks to the translation app on my phone. If you're into emulating retro handheld games, I recommend checking it out. Lastly, my original script planned for a short review of every Mizuki manga I read over the past month and why I found him so inspirational, but I'm saving it for another video since it would have been such a small segment in an otherwise massive video. So before I end the video, I wanted to apologize for its length and the month it took for me to make. I typically prioritize brevity with my videos and just try and focus on efficient content and staying consistent with things, but I had a hard time because there was so much more that I wanted to say but I couldn't, and so much more that I wanted to talk about, but I just didn't want to watch hundreds of episodes of raw anime, and some of the ones I wanted to watch, I couldn't find them. There's a lot of good episode directors that we don't have their content subtitled, and I can totally understand why this isn't licensed. It's something that's totally niche. People here don't really know or care about yokai stuff, so it's really like a niche market. Plus, on top of that, like for fan subbers, it's, just, you know, the unsung heroes of anime. They're just... It's not a practical use of time to subtitle 
so many different episodes that cover the same content that are slightly different that, you know, I can, I can get that. I understand why they're not all subtitled, but I just wish there was more I could watch. I wish they were in better condition, but it is what it is, and I hope that I was able to shed enough light on the series so that you can go out there with a good understanding of the franchise and have a good time with it and watch the episodes that are right for you. Because like I said, I didn't enjoy every episode of every entry, but I did enjoy a lot of them, and I hope you enjoy them too. So if you watch some of them because of this video, come back and let me know what you think, because I love to hear these things when I get people into anime and they have good experiences. Because some of these episodes are really like heavy-hitting emotional, especially that slipper one I talked about, but they're really good. So let me know what you think about it in the comments section below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon with Sabutoichi, another 60s anime. It's great, though. Just wait.